Alright, podcast 5.2.4. Plate tectonics, ocean currents, and the Earth's climate. You see there's a connection between plate tectonics, ocean currents, and the climate. Wow. We've learned about ocean currents. That was a 3.1 chapter. We learned about plate tectonics. That was 1.2 chapter. Hmm, there's a connection. Yeah, that's right. So let's make this podcast about making connections. Okay. Well, let's talk about regional climates and ocean currents. <coughs> All right. If you have a community that lives near the ocean, then you will have a milder climate than one at the same latitude inland. All right, let's take a case in point. Let's take, um, draw a map here. This would be the coast of California. Let's say that San Diego, California is right here. So if you know this, and this of course would be the Pacific Ocean. PO, Pacific Ocean, I'll say Pacific Ocean. Okay, if you live in the, the area around San Diego, California, you see the ocean is right here. And the ocean, of course, being blue, let's make it blue, show it's blue right here, is it's going to cause the climate to be more mild because you see um, this water, which happens to be cooler than the land typically, this is going to blow air across here and make this area cooler. If you go further inland, there's actually some mountains right here. Not significant mountains, but there's some mountains. And you find this area right here, and if you're a, a good geography student, yeah, that's the Mojave. Mojave, I probably butchered that, desert, right? And that's a very harsh climate. It's hot. You know, Phoenix, Arizona is right over here, and it gets like 100 and stupid, like 10 degrees and stuff like that. And, you know, San Diego is a mild climate because it lives near the ocean. You see, water has an interesting property, is that it has a, what we call a high specific heat. That means it holds more energy than something with a low specific heat. And so what that causes is it causes your substance or the water to um, hold that energy in. And so it kind of, you know, the, when the sun um, rays shine down, it hits the water and it doesn't warm up the temperature of the water as much because it can hold a lot of heat. And that keeps the climate around San Diego mild. And that's true around anything. My, my parents at one point had thought about living um, on a boat. Actually, my dad lived, did live on a boat for a couple of years. But when they were uh, thinking about living on a boat, uh, actually a houseboat, they actually built houses on these like pontoons and stuff like that. That's what we're thinking about, building a full house on top of pontoons. Um, one thing that they were looking forward to is that just when you're living right on the water is if it was at the winter time, then the water would heat up your house. And if it was the summertime, okay, no. Yeah, it would heat up your house in the summertime, so the heat would go from the water there. And then um, the air around your house in the summertime would be cooler. And so um, it's, a, it's a great place to live because uh, it causes your climate to be more mild. Okay? Now let's take a couple of examples here and to kind of illustrate this. Let's talk about the climate of um, England, or at least uh, Brit uh, United Kingdom, I guess you would call it. Now along the United Kingdom, there is a warm water current that comes up from the south. Um, this is in the Northern Hemisphere, right? England is in the Northern Hemisphere, and I hope you know that. Uh, it has the energy, uh, or as the current flows from the south to the north, it carries warm water. This warm water right here um, then creates moisture that then f flows over uh, England and Ireland and all that kind of stuff, making a relatively wet but a relatively mild climate for its latitude. Because if you were actually to figure out the latitude of Great Britain, you'd find it to be very high um, in terms of its latitude, and then, you know, like equivalent to um, the middle part of Canada, which is typically thought as a bitter cold place, but England is not bitter cold, and that is because of the warm water current. Conversely, we could take a look at the eastern United States. Same kind of ball game here is that we have um, a warm water current coming up from the equator. It's called the Atlantic Equatorial Current, and it's coming up, and as it comes up, it keeps this area over here relatively mild, and in some cases actually quite hot. Um, uh, hot and humid, basically, this area is. I mean, if you've been to Florida, it's a hot and humid place. Um, if you've been to, you know, Alabama, and uh, this would be Georgia, I guess, and Alabama's over here, I guess, um, then you would get a hot, basically a hot, humid climate. Now, this doesn't mean they can't get cold weather. When they do get cold weather, it's a rarity, but basically that's going to come um, off really usually from Canada, and that cold air descends into um, this part of the United States and then makes it colder. So it's because of this current right here, and also to some degree based on the latitude that it's at. Um, the equator is down here pretty significantly, though. All right. Or we could take a look at the western United States. The western United States, interestingly enough, has the opposite effect. There's a cold water current coming across of um, uh, California. Um, 
Uh, it's much more pleasant to swim over on the eastern seaboard because the water's warmer. It's very cold water to swim. I, I once did a, a triathlon that was called the Escape from Alcatraz Triathlon, where you swim in what's called uh, um, the uh, San Francisco Bay, and the water's very cold, very, very cold. Trust me, I'm wearing a wetsuit, I'm still cold in that race. So, uh, yeah, th so this is just, uh, it's cold water, and that's going to cause um, the area here to be colder. And this is a more pleasant place to live in some regards uh, because it's a more mild climate. Uh, it's not so hot as it would be, say, over here. All right. Now, ocean currents and global. Last time I was just talking about regional, but what about the entire global climate? Well, here's sort of an interesting issue. The equator gets more radiation from the sun. And then the poles get less radiation from the sun. Well, that makes sense. I mean, you know that. You've got the Earth, boom, here. The North Pole and the South Pole, uh, they get less energy, and the equator get more. Well, that makes sense. Everybody, duh, duh, right? But here's the question. Why don't the poles get colder and the equator get warmer? If constantly more energy is going into the equator and less energy into the poles, why doesn't the temperature of the equator get higher and higher and higher every year? And the uh, poles get lower and lower and lower every year. Hmm. That doesn't make sense. That actually makes sense. So that's kind of an interesting question. And that's, the answer to that question has to do with uh, something that scientists will call energy transfer. Or energy transport, I should say. Basically what we're saying is that the energy, uh, remember things always um, flow from hot to cold. The energy is transported essentially from the equator um, to the rest of the world. To illustrate that here, we'd go, you know, it's going to go from the equator north and from the equator south. Now, it curves and stuff like that, and that's Coriolis effect and all that kind of stuff we talked about earlier. But we have these huge energy transport systems. What's the energy being transported in? It's being transported in fluids. What are the fluids? Um, air. Is a fluid. I know it's hard to think of air as a fluid, but it is. Uh, this would be weather. Uh, think of a hurricane. You know what a hurricane is? It's a huge energy transport system. Where do they come from? You know, they're trying to strike Florida and stuff like that. They come from the south. So that's from the equator, all that energy is. It's moving that energy from the equator up north. Okay? The other thing is water. Water's a fluid too. And so we've got another energy transport system, which is called ocean currents. So energy is being distributed essentially from the equator out. Now, we get energy at other places, but it's very important to understand that energy has to be moved around or we're going to have weird issues on the world. The world would be super duper hot in one place and then super duper cold in another. But because the energy is being moved around through the air, weather, and through the water, ocean currents, then um, it keeps the climate of the Earth stable meaning that the climate doesn't change significantly over time. There's some issues on that, which we'll talk about in the next podcast. But, yeah, there's this huge energy transport system. We've got to move this energy around in our fluid systems, air and water. So this one, this slide here kind of illustrates that. So both ocean currents and wind currents move energy around the world, keeping the global climate stable. That's the purpose of currents. I'm talking actually about wind currents, air, and ocean currents, water. All right, those are the things that are moving the energy around the Earth. Okay, um, let's take a look at a recent discovery that um, has just been made about ocean currents. It's the fastest, actually, I should say, deep water ocean current ever discovered. It was discovered off the coast of Antarctica, yeah, Antarctica, and they discovered some interesting stuff about that. So let's take a look at this particular um, news article that I found just this week. So I found this on uh, one of the news sites, um, foxnews.com it looks like. And the fastest ocean current ever flows beneath Antarctica. Okay, And um, they found this, and it has a volume of 40 Amazon rivers. If you look right here, that's a lot. 40 Amazon rivers, that's a lot of volume of water. We can see they have a picture of the global climates there. And what else have we discovered? It moves an average of 7.9 inches a second which sounds kind of slow, but um, it produces tons and tons of water. In fact, it will, not just tons, but 12 million cubic meters of water every second. Wow. And this is related to what's called the global conveyor belt. We talked about it in a previous podcast. So it's interesting to see how this, uh, this discovery here um, helps us to understand the way the world works today. So 
I think that's just kind of fascinating and interesting to learn how that works.